Good day everyone! Our discussion focuses on the dark side, particularly the metaphor. Metaphor and this phenomenon raises two main questions. First, what is metaphorical meaning? And second, how do hearers grasp metaphorical meaning as readily as they do? A lot of theories and theorists define metaphor. Most theorists have thought that it is somehow a matter of bringing out similarities between things or states of affairs. Donald Davidson argues that bringing out is purely causal, and in no way linguistic, hearing the metaphor just somehow has the effect of making us see similarity. The naive simile theory states that metaphors simply abbreviate explicit literal comparisons. On the other hand, figurative simile theory states that metaphors are short for similes themselves taken figuratively. This view avoids the three most obvious objections to the naive simile theory, but not all the tough ones. If we talk about metaphor, there is a philosophical bias because philosophers like language to be literal. Philosophers tend to think that literal speech is the default and metaphorical utterances are occasional aberrations made mainly by poets and poets monkey. But the main idea there is that bias is just a bias. Sentences are very often used in perfectly ordinary context with other than literal meanings. It can be concluded that virtually every sentence produced by any human being contains importantly metaphorical or other figurative elements. Say for example, the word level. It's almost invariably metaphor unless the speaker talks about a horizontal layer of some physical thing. There is a claim that almost every sentence contains figurative elements, and it is widely approved. Why? Because everyone grants that among the literal expressions are many dead metaphors. Metaphor can be connected to phrases that evolved from what were originally novel metaphors but have turned into idioms or cliché, and now mean literally what they used to mean metaphorically. Let's take these examples. The word mouth in the phrase the river's mouth. Only few could identify that this mouth in this phrase means metaphorical allusion to human or animal mouths. Same goes with the word level in the phrase carpenter's level, where the meaning of the level is a tool. Of course, the distinction between novel or fresh metaphor and dead metaphor is one of smooth degree, not of kind. Lakoff and Johnson in 1980 states that fresh metaphors get picked up and become current and then only very gradually, sometimes over centuries, sicken, harden, and eventually die. Now let's get into the issues and two simple theories. There is some variation in taxonomy as to how metaphor is classified with respect to other figures of speech. Some theorists use the term metaphor very broadly as almost synonymous with the word figurative. But others use it very narrowly as naming one very specific figure alongside many other ones. Now, let's get into the main philosophical questions concerning metaphor. The first question is, what is metaphorical meaning broadly construed? And the second, and by what mechanism is it conveyed? Aside from these, metaphor raises many further important philosophical questions about the rationale for expressing oneself metaphorically instead of directly the distinctive effectiveness and power of metaphor as a figure of speech and the centrality of metaphor in each of several walks of life. Let's take these examples. 1. Simon is a rock. 2. Juliet is a sun. 3. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by the sun of York. Number 4. When the blood burns, how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows. It can be observed that the sentences have metaphors. The word rock, sun, soul, and song. Bursley of 1967 identifies two features working in tandem. Within such a sentence, there is conceptual tension. Like in examples given, human beings differ categorically from rocks or suns, and souls and tongues are not the kinds of things that could interact commercially. Yet, the sentence isn't only intelligible, but perhaps even exceptionally informative or illuminating and may express an important truth. Lastly, other theorists have expressed the first of these two features more strongly, saying that a metaphorical sentence interpreted literally is incoherent, absurd, or at best transparently and wildly false.
This time, let's get into the theories. Good day everyone! This is Lizal Mariales and now let's take a look at David Son's causal theory and the naive simile theory. What makes an expression cognitively meaningful to say that a sentence is true or false? Does it have to contain a correct information in the entire sentence? Does it have to be literal in its meaning to say that it is right or wrong? During the logical positivist period, figurative language was thoroughly disdained, presumably on the account of the positivist veris verificationism since such sentences as 1 to 4 cannot be verified empirically in the usual way. They were judged not to be cognitively meaningful. On this view, there is no such thing as metaphorical meaning, if by meaning one means linguistic meaning. There is only emotive or affective significance. Davidson's causal theory rejects metaphorical meaning. It denies the existence of linguistic mechanisms by which metaphorical significance is conveyed. Unlike the positivists, Donald Davidson thinks that sentences in 1 to 4 have meanings, but meanings are just literal. Metaphors mean what the words mean in their most literal interpretation and nothing more. When Romeo uttered the sentence, Juliet is the son, this literally means that something is clearly false because Juliet can never be the sun, but metaphorically, it means something may be true. David's son is devoted to his negative case against metaphorical meaning, but he does catch a positive account of the significance of metaphor. It is br brutally causal. A metaphor makes us attend to some likeness often a novel or surprising likeness between two or more things. A simile tells us in part what the metaphor merely nudges us into noting. How metaphorical utterances differ from nonsense rings. David Son's view implies that the only relevant difference between them is that metaphorical utterances have psychological effects. The metaphorical utterances also have a huge cognitive difference. We often not understand them, but can paraphrase them, or literally, we draw inferences from them. We sometimes take ourselves to have learned new empirical facts from having heard metaphorical utterances. That cognitive value manifestly does not derive their usual bizarre literal meanings. And if David Sod is right, one can never misinterpret a metaphor. David Sod cannot allow for metaphorical truth. And if metaphorical utterances have only literal meaning, there being no other candidate for a bearer of truth value, they will normally be false and only occasionally and accidentally true. Even if we discount a controversially dead metaphor, Few human utterances are entirely free of metaphorical elements. If metaphorical utterances are rarely true, then utterances are rarely true. Finally, Mora notes that when a metaphor dies, the relevant expression acquires a new literal meaning and accordingly gets an additional dictionary entry. This would be inexplicable or at least arbitrary and odd if the metaphor had previously had no sort of meaning at all. And there are contemporary views that reject metaphorical sentence meaning, but give more plausible accounts of metaphorical communication. Given the availability of such accounts, there is no reason to accept Davidson's purely causal theory. Now let's go to the naive simile theory. Philosophers beginning with Aristotle have noticed a striking similarity between metaphors and similes. It seems that both metaphors and similes express or invite comparisons of their topics to something a bit unexpected. Simon was like a rock and Juliet is like the sun in one or more respects and Edward IV resembled the sun in perhaps a different way. This suggests an even closer kinship. 
the idea that a metaphor is just an abbreviated simile. According to the naive theory in particular, a metaphor derives from the corresponding simile by ellipsis. This simile view reconciles birds lead to two features. It accommodates the conceptual tension, characterizing a metaphor while explaining the metaphor's intelligibility. The intelligibility is straightforward since statements of likeness or resemblance are obviously intelligible. The tension arises from the move from likeness to actual ascription. Juliet is the sun. The naive simile theory has seemed plausible and even taken for granted by many litera literary theorists and philosophers alike, but it faces objections, of which here are three. Objection number one. Birdley complains that although the theory does explain the distinctive tension in the way it is noted, that explanation is very shallow. If a metaphor is only short for the corresponding simile, then it is simply synonymous with the simile and should not be heard as anomalous or puzzling in the first place. On this view, the tension is mere surface appearance, but that seems wrong. There is no particular tension in Juliet is like the sun, even if one wants to be told more about the respects in which Juliet resembles the sun. One feels that a metaphor works by containing an inherent tension that is more substantive. Davidson and Searle will go on to argue that in particular, the metaphor works by having the anomalous literal meaning that it does. Objection number two. Searle complains that a simile taken by itself is almost entirely an informative. Similarity is a vacuous predicate. Any two things are similar in some respect or other. In what way is Juliet supposedly like the sun? That by being a gigantic wall of gas, or by consisting a large part of nuclear fusion, or by being 93 million miles from the Earth. As Searle points out, those properties are salient and well-known features of the sun, yet the naive simile theory gives no hint as to why Romeo's metaphor imputes different properties to Juliet rather than those. Thus, the theory fails to offer any mechanism by which metaphorical significance might be conveyed. Objection number three. Even when we have identified the relevant respects of similarity, they often prove to be themselves metaphorical. Searle gives the example, Sally is a block of ice. How, according to the naive simile theorist, is Sally like a block of ice? Perhaps she is hard and very cold, but not of course literally hard and cold. Hard and cold are themselves used metaphorically here. So, Sally is only like something that is hard and cold. In what ways? Perhaps, perhaps she is unyielding, unemotional, and unresponsive. But Searle points out, there is no sense in which block of ice are unyielding and emotional and unresponsive, but many other inanimate things are not. Bonfires too are unyielding and emotional and unresponsive, but neither Sally is like a bonfire nor Sally is a bonfire is metaphorically compatible with the original sentence. The naive simile theorists would have to insist that there is a further underlying literal similarity between cold things and unemotional things, but we are given no evidence for that claim. Searle conjectures that on the grounds of heaven knows what psychological factors people find the notion of coldness associated in their minds with lack of emotion. This, lack object, uh, this last objection suggests a simple but radical modification of the naive theory, which preserves the central claim that metaphors are compressed similes but avoids most of our six objections. It is articulated and defended at length by Fodgelin that metaphors abrogate not similes taken literally, but similes themselves taken figuratively.